Corey here from The Mentor to Engineer. I thank you for choosing to watch this video. This video is part of a series that's somewhat technical. Uh, it's made for engineers that have already taken some sort of strength of materials class and probably haven't used it in forever. So we're gonna kinda go a little bit fast because this is a refresher for uh, my target audience. Uh, so there's a lot of terms and stuff that won't be defined or uh, clarified that you should probably already have an understanding for. So the Mentored Engineer uh, aims to bridge the gap between uh, college and the real world. And by offering classes like this for free, uh, we are able to do that. So please like, share, and subscribe so that the channel can grow and we can help more and more engineers. Uh, as for me, my primary business is consulting. I do a large amount of structural calculations, FEA, and design work for all sorts of apparatus. And if you need help in your project, please reach out below into the, uh, the comments. I have my contact information there, or you can go to rasmussendesigns.net. So in modern times with uh, computers and most importantly, FEA, um, you know, Mike and I are from an older generation where we are hesitant to use FEA in the design process, uh, just because uh, it's, it's very slow. Um, you know, I can't tell you how many times I hear, I'm gonna do a quickie F FEA on that. And I'm like, uh, there's nothing quick about it. So um, how, how was your design process back in the days when we didn't have FEA? Uh, or if, if you were designing something now and needed to use FEA, how would you combine those two? Um, I, I was trained by the old school. So I would start with uh, standard practices of, uh, of uh, classical calculations and basically basically you know if you if you've got a beam if you've got a beam and it's loaded like this it might be supported on the ends and we can do calculations for that and if I pull out Ma master handbook machinery's handbook yeah man this one's been well used and it's got index tabs, but I do have a newer one, but I know where everything is uh, in this one. I was going to so say, that's the 18th edition. 18th that's, edition. Uh, I know they're at least on 27. Well, the man that taught me had an 8th edition. Wow. <laughs> and they weren't much different. Um, resources. Oh, by the way, if you ever get that book, The Machinery's Handbook, get the large print edition. <laughs> it's very it's very compact, yes. but. Uh, uh, resource materials on elementary strength of materials like Ferry's Design on Machine Elements or Timoshenko or uh, Shigley. Shigley. Those three are very good basic starts and everybody needs to start there before you jump into FEA. And don't forget uh, Omar Blodgett's uh, Design of Weldments. Yes. Um, because they cover the basic. The Machinery Handbook has got a table that shows you how to how to define the stress for this. Right. So. You know, if I've got one, say I just have a single load in the center. I'm making a bad job of racing, so I got a load here. And this one's all, we know what this is, half the load. If this is in the middle, half the load. And so I know by memory the stress is uh, WL over 4Z. So now we talk about what those things are. Right. This is what we call a section modulus. We're going and to be getting to this part yeah, later. We'll let's, get into that later. So there's a formula that'll tell me what the stress is here. We can also calculate the stress anywhere along there. And, uh, and so the, using the handbooks, you can find many, many cases. Another, another advantage of classical is the law of superposition. That if you've got another load on here, you can treat it as a separate load and add them together. That's right. And if you add them together, they'll give you the right answer. So right. fortunately, we can do that. You know, FEA does it for you internally. Bridge one of the one guess. of the innovations in bridge designs, if you look at a railroad bridge or an old highway bridge, is is uh, trusses and beams. And let's say you're going across a river, and you got a bridge here, and they would do this with trusses. I finish finish that, and then maybe they put some in between. Maybe there'd be some across the top, you know, I draw the top of the bridge and they'd be, they'd try to tie them together. My first experience with FEA, here's the other side of the bridge and of course cars are going across this way, but they, the trestles were used to keep beams in tension. These are, these are like struts. Right. Uh, 
Another example is the Golden Gate Bridge where their cables holding it up and they're all in tension and then they had a big cable that was a, a big cable on each side that was a catenary and they were supported by towers. Absolutely. Um, the, when I did my first FEA 44 years ago, which we had to use an acoustic coupler and a cassette tape <laughs> to record the data, we built it like this. We built it with elements. And so you had to define each of these elements, which was kind of interesting to think that they started with, with trusses like this and FEA jumped into that by putting the properties of these elements in. And then you, then you defined each joint and we loaded it all into a computer that went to Ford Motor Company. It was used, I think it was first used in the Pinto design, but no. that doesn't say much for it. But <laughs> they had a computer in Ohio that we'd send the data in acoustic coupler and uh, probably at the end of the day we might get it back and they would print it on a CalComp rotary plotter <laughs> and then it would print out digital data oh, wow. and so you had, to, you had to get all of that back they would actually call you back when it, <laughs> when it was done so it would take to do it to do a structural frame would take probably two days to get it run and then you had to look at it and it took another two days to decipher the encoded data right. But that was basically how FEA started with these kind of lattice frames. And okay. uh, probably can very much like that today. Absolutely. Now, for those of you who don't know, he made reference to the Ford Pinto, which was, you know, one of Ford's, uh, uh, those black marks that you can't get rid of, uh, famous, where it had problems where uh, if you ran into it, uh, got rear-ended, it uh, uh, would burst the, hot, uh, the gas tank and could explode. Yeah, it was, it was a good idea, but didn't work. But uh, for, fortunately, the structure of the Pinto was okay. <laughs> right. But that was where they first did it. They had a computer that was probably took up a, a half a building that would do this. Right. Uh, the old IBM 370. So somebody, we, we did, it was, it was very successful because I used it on a 67 foot wide machine in farm equipment. So. Excellent. So it was good and it, it was good. It would give you deflections, but, but that was only after we'd done our original design and manual design with, with hand calculations with hand calculations and then we used it to verify as a verifier not a designer right so i guess that's the the big takeaway that i want to get here is we, we would mike and i would prefer to use fea as a check and i i have a hard time doing this sometimes but i know that when i have a bad fea run i need to go back and do calculations on it and then change make changes and then run the FEA again as a check that way it's still just a check and not mm -hmm. designing I'm still the designer I'm not being forced to do something by a computer before you do an FEA you need to understand what you expect to happen absolutely and and otherwise if you just throw something together and says well we'll see if that works right number one you're gonna put material where you don't need material you're gonna put it in the wrong place if you don't understand these basics and then you're gonna wonder what happened when it doesn't work right or look right yep. and, and know how to fix it well if you've done your if you've done classical analysis and understand like I said those sharp turns those restriction points the uh, the uh, anomalies of basic basic uh, stress analysis if you don't understand those you probably are just shooting in the dark if you're trying to repair a bad VA. Right. Especially if you're trying to find out why you're having a certain problem and how to fix that. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just, it's, it, it's a time consuming process. FEA seems quick because it, man, it calculates everything right away, but it really isn't. Uh, I've wasted days and days just not going back and doing a simple calculation and, and being like, oh yeah, I drastically undersized that component. Uh, mm -hmm. And then went back and made it a little thicker, whatever needed to be done, and it changes everything. Yeah, so um, just recently did a did an FEA work on us, well, not a very large component assembly, and uh, you got to remember it's not cheap. It was six thousand dollars a run oh. to run this, for them to model it, to run it on an ANSYS system, and bring it back to us. All right. So so you're wasting a lot of money and a lot of time. Absolutely. Yeah. If you just sat down and and you make sure you got it right the first time. Your goal is to put the FEA together and it just shows you, you know, this is what our assumptions were right. 
and there's always going to be when when you're in a complicated machine and and we're not perfect engineers we're we well, try to be but we're not perfect but it'll show you where you know wait a minute why is that doing that so I need to go back and look at it but always you need to have a good understanding of what's going on before you just pull out this nice colored piece of paper and uh, <laughs> and say whoa there looks good or it looks bad right and the computers only do what you tell them to do right they still That's don't right. they haven't taken over the world yet they still only do what they what you tell them to do Excellent.